Yes. What did you say? No, but I listened to it last night again. It's so good to see all y'all out tonight. And this is a, the best song. It's how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. What do, you, what do you think about every day whenever you go somewhere and someone talks about Jesus? Doesn't it make you, your ears prick up a little bit? And that's what we're going to sing about tonight. 323, please. We will sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas, please. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. And drives away his fears. It makes the wounded spirit whole and calm the troubled breast it's matter to the hungry soul and to the weary rest and to the weary rest Jesus my shepherd brother friend my prophet priest and king my lord my life my way I bring except the praise I bring good singing I'm not familiar that much with that hymn but it was written by John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace so Sometimes it's neat to see some of those connections on people that uh, write different hymns and if you know their story. Uh, John Newton was an abolitionist, early abolitionist in England who fought the slave trade and eventually was pretty much responsible for outlawing it in England. He was very passionate about that. Well, tonight we'll be in Psalm 5 this evening. Psalm 5. And Psalm 5 is similar in some of the themes to Psalm 3, okay? Uh, so like Psalm 3, Psalm 5 is what we would consider a morning psalm, which is a, a theme you'll see a lot in the, uh, the Psalms of David. The, he, David was a man who repeatedly, you see in his own psalms, who uh, did some sort of devotion, prayer, praise in the morning. And so this is sometimes called a, a morning psalm. Um, it's just an interesting theme from uh, the life of David. Not saying that the morning is the only time you ought to have some sort of time with the Lord, but for David, it was one of the things he did first. Um, and I think there is some, some wisdom in that. But it's also what we would call a uh, imprecatory psalm, which basically means it is a psalm that contains curses <laughs> uh, on enemies. Okay, um, And if we were to look at this historically, David's going on through something. It could be that it connects to his son Absalom, who if we remember we've already read about him. Uh, Absalom was David's son who was trying to kill him and destroy him to take the throne. Some of that is because of his own personal sin with his sin with Bathsheba, and he's had an affair, and uh, he tried to cover up the pregnancy and basically murdered her husband. And because of all this sin and secret sin and God has judged him for that, and one of the things he says is, you know, you're, you're going to be a man of war, and your, your family's going to be pretty much cursed because of this, and so this could be some of what's going on in Psalm 5, but we don't know that, um, but it's called an imprecatory psalm, which contains curses against enemies, and we'll get to that and why that sometimes is biblical, uh, but how we also need to look at it through the proper lens because we don't need to go around praying curses on people that's not really what david's doing although that's what it looks like from the from the outside so we'll look at that so in these these imprecatory psalms uh the writers whoever they are and david does a lot of them seem to describe a god of wrath who judges destroys even sinners okay now that seems harsh by today's standards doesn't it 
right? That God judges sinful people. But we need to understand that God does that. That is a part of God's character, okay? That's not to say that God is not also loving and merciful and gracious, but those concepts of God need to be tempered by understanding that God doesn't, he hates sin. When we understand that God hates sin and wants to destroy sinful people, that also opens the way for us to also see his grace and his love and his mercy because he also freely offers these things too. And so wrath is a biblical concept. So we don't want to shy away from that term because we live in 2021 and we, we want to focus so much, or the world wants to focus so much on God being loving. Is God love? Yes, the Bible says so, right? But God is not only loving. That's not the only characteristic that he has. He's holy, he's just, he's jealous, he does have wrath towards sinful people. Am I making a weird noise? Is that me? Is that my popping? I'm sorry. It was just bugging me. Okay, all right, we'll keep going. Um, so it's right for us to look at some of those, uh, those characteristics because they are equally a part of God's character. So God is love according to 1 John 4, but God is also light, 1 John 1. And light can't fellowship with darkness, right? So we need to see that. So also I think when we shy away from looking and dealing with the concept of God's wrath, a lot of it is, a, is because I think we downplay sin. Does that make sense? Well, we don't really think of people really being sinful. Like, it's hard to, to understand wrath if we don't think people are really sinful, right? But people are sinful. We're born sinful, right? Even after we get saved, we're still sinful and we struggle with sin, right? So we need to understand. So like in the cross, you see two things in the cross. You see, one, that God definitely hates sin because he killed his only son to deal with it. But you also see the supreme demonstration of God's love because he also freely offers his son to deal with sin. You see both wrath and love in the same, uh, the same moment. And so in Psalm 5, David gives us three valuable instructions to encourage us in some sort of daily fellowship with the Lord. David does it in the morning. I'm not going to say that's the only time that we should do that. I'm not even going to say that's the best time for you to do that because everybody is wired differently, okay? But for David, it was in the morning, okay? So let's read verses 1 through 3 first. It says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. The first kind of principle we ought to see if we're going to have a consistent time with the Lord is this. We must plan and prepare to do it. We must prepare and plan to do it. Right? He says, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Watch, if you were to get an invitation to go to the White House, whether or not you liked the president or not, you had an opportunity to go, most of us would go. And if we went, what would we do? We would prepare for that, wouldn't we? I mean, you know, most of us would probably dress nice. You know, we'd probably at least take a shower before we went. Like, we would prepare for that meeting, okay? If you were going to a job interview, you would not just roll out of bed Put on your pajamas. Well, you shouldn't. Let me phrase that. Some people might would. Uh, but if you really want to impress someone to get that job, you're going you're gonna to dress for the occasion. You're going to prepare, right? Now, I'm leaving for a short couple of days in Nashville next week to, to, to go to an executive committee meeting. And I've already thought, like, all right, these are things I need to have. <laughs> I need to, you know what I mean? Like, do I have enough travel toothpaste? Do I, you see what I'm saying? Like, we just prepare. And so David has made preparation to do this. And I think that's one reason you always see him do it in the morning because he's already made that his mind up that that's what he's going to do. You know, if you're going to if you're going to be sure to go to church on Sunday, the decision really needs to be made Saturday, <laughs> right? Like you don't just wake up Sunday. Well, am I going to church? No, I mean you need to make your mind up so Saturday. You know, if that means you need to get home a little earlier from doing whatever, well, you, we do those things. We make those decisions on things that are important. And so for David, he plans and prepares for that. Also notice 
part of the pre- preparation and planning is also entails a little bit of honesty. Notice what he says. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry. Right? He's honest here. Okay, one of the things I love about David is he shows us that it's entirely appropriate to be completely open and honest with the Lord. It's okay to realize, God, I need you to hear my groanings. I am at my wit's end. I have nothing for this moment. You know, or I'm I'm furious about this situation. I'm confused about this way. It's it's okay to be honest before the Lord. I kind of had that feeling growing up that you know, you, you could never question the Lord. Now, I want to be very careful in how I say this, okay? Part of the, the problem with questioning the Lord is we've got to make sure we understand who we are before the Lord, okay? But it's okay to ask why. I mean, if you, don't, if you read the Psalms, David is always asking why, right? But that never meant for him that he didn't trust the Lord. It never meant that he didn't know God was in control, but he can still question because that's a part of being, being honest. David knew that the Lord understood the groanings, and he knew that the Lord understood his size. That's a part of being honest, right? When we know God understands us, when we know God can hear us, when we know God clearly knows what's going on, we have to be honest. Imagine being able to talk to somebody personally that fully understands what's going on in you in your heart, in your soul, and knows perfectly everything about the situation. That's some of the reasons we have communication problems, because no one understands, people don't see things the way we do. God perfectly sees all of it. So we can be honest before the Lord, right? So David was not only faithful in his praying each morning, he was also organized, I think, in the way he did it. Because also notice it says, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you, and watch. We'll get to that in a second. That word there, prepare, in verse 3, is used to describe the placing of the pieces of an animal sacrifice in order on an altar, but it also has a military connection. Um, It almost means a soldier presenting himself to his commander to receive orders, and it can be used as an army set in battle array on the field. So while David himself was a military man, right, he's clearly a man of war, um, and had multiple armies at his disposal and understood what it was like to have soldiers come and present themselves to him to get their orders from David, David also here is presenting himself in the same way before the Lord. So he understood his place in that, uh, in that relationship. So in essence, I think in the first three verses, what you're seeing here is that our daily devotions with the Lord, in our daily devotions with the Lord, uh, we should come like priests bringing sacrifices to the altar, but also like soldiers reporting for duty. And I think that's what David was saying. He's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not holy, but I'm ready to get to work. Right? And I think that's a good way for us to, to understand our time with the Lord. Like, God, I need your grace in my life, but I'm willing to be faithful in whatever you want me to do. That's a great way for us to have uh, a time with the Lord. That doesn't happen when we just quickly do our three-minute devotion just to say we did it, right? Now, I would say that three-minute devotion is better than no devotion. But David says, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice and watch, or I wait, right? Right? meaning that he gets up early enough to make sure he has time for this. If you say you don't have enough time to read the Bible all the way through in a year, I would say, do you have Netflix? Do you watch TV? Like, we have time to do things that are important, right? We always do. We always have time to do what's important in our life. For David, he plans and prepares to meet with the Lord. For him, it's in the morning. Okay, that verses 1 through 3. Now let's read verses 4 through 6. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. The second principle we see is we must seek to please the Lord in how we live. All right, because he's going to compare himself 
to those outside of the Lord's will. Okay? God, it says here that God does not delight in wickedness. Okay? He has no pleasure in that. Right? That means that he cannot be neutral about sin. Okay? God is not neutral about sin. He has an opinion. Okay? We don't judge people. That's not our job. That's the Lord's job. But God himself is not neutral about it. Therefore, we must remember that God delights in those who fear him. Right? Evil may not dwell with you. And he says, the boastful shall not stand before you eye, your eyes. You hate all evil doers. So we don't need to be those people. <laughs> right? I mean, we don't need to be evil doers. We don't need to be deceitful. We don't need to be those kind of people. We don't need to be people that speak lies. Right? We don't need to be bloodthirsty and deceitful. We should be opposite of that if we know the Lord. So while God is a loving, gracious, and merciful God, he also cannot ignore sin. Okay? And that's, a, that's something we need to under, We need to have a biblical understanding of sin um, because it's something that's evidently everywhere, even in our own hearts and our own lives. David clearly understood that too. Okay, he's not trying to say he's sinful because notice in verse 3, he's already said, I prepare a sacrifice. Why does he need a sacrifice? Because he's sinful. All right, so he's already saying, I'm not, he's not saying, you know, I'm so glad I'm not like those sinful people. He's like, man, that's why I got up early. <laughs> I know I'm a sinful person. Like, I'm, I need time with the Lord. I better offer sacrifice. Then he gets there. Does that make sense? He's not trying to make it out like he's holy. He's not doing that at all. So the Lord expects those who love him to also hate what he hates and love what he loves. Okay? says in Psalm 97, 10, Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. It says in Amos 5, 15, Hate evil and love good and establish justice. It says in Romans 12, 9, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. God is not uh, neutral on sin, neither should we be. We can't be neutral about it. It's a big deal right? So we don't want to downplay it in our own life, okay? I'm not saying we just need to go around beating ourselves up all the time that we're just awful, horrible people because we need to understand God's grace in our life. We're also forgiven and redeemed in Christ, but we need to, we need to understand sin's a big deal. And we know sin's a big deal because Jesus died for it. I mean, if the Son of God's got to die to fix it, you know it's a big deal, okay? So if we, so God's hatred of evil isn't emotional though okay it's judicial and here's what i mean by judicial god looks at it as a judge okay who's perfect who's righteous who's holy who's not guilty of anything okay and he looks at it through those eyes of you are guilty and because of our guilt in any sort of judicial system there's a punishment that comes along with being guilty right so in his justice, he says we're guilty, but in his love, he also provides the punishment sacrifice, right? That's what changes everything. He says, we're guilty, but I'm going to get out of my judgment seat, take your place, and I will take your punishment. So we know it's a big deal. So if we want genuine fellowship with God, then we need to feel the same anguish as we see the evil in the world that we see. And I think anguish is like anger plus love. It's okay to see the sinful stuff that we see and be angry about it. But we also understand that we must love people too. Right? It's okay to, to have both those feelings. That's where you get anguish. Right? That's when, you know, if you think the most hurt you've ever had emotionally, it's genuinely from someone you love the most. If you don't care about what a person, if you don't care about this person, when they hurt you, it doesn't really bother you. If they betray you, you kind of expect it, right? But when you've got a meaningful relationship with that person, that's when it hurts the most. That's why uh, pain in marriage sometimes the worst, because it's the person you love the most, right? So we need to feel anguish. We feel anger at what we see, but also the love that we should have, too. And that's what God does. So we should seek to please the Lord in how we live. Now let's look at verses... 7 through 12. 
But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. The third and last principle we see here is we must submit to the Lord in our life. We must submit. If we're, we're, we're talking about maybe having time with the Lord, just learning about the Lord's not enough, right? We got to do what it says. Those of you that have kids, you don't just want your kids to listen to you. You want them to do what you say, <laughs> right? Don't touch the oven or don't touch the iron when it's hot. You don't want them just to hear you. You want them to do it. Because what happens if they touch it? They burn themselves, right? Like there's, there's, there's some of that in this relationship. Because notice what he says in verse 7, but I. David here is contrasting himself with the group above that are wicked and boastful and deceitful. But I. He's contrasting himself with the wicked crowd that has rebelled against the king, right? David had come to pray. David had come to worship, had come to have a meaningful relationship, had come to have devotion even, right? And he basically has three requests here in this section. Through 7 and 8, he prays for God's guidance. Notice what he says. I will enter uh, your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your ways straight before me. He's asking God to guide his steps. Make your way straight because sometimes the way is crooked, right? Jesus kind of knows that, and he says, you know, broad's the way leading to destruction, but narrow's the way leading to life, and what few find it. The people that find it are the ones that God opens it up before them. Because if not, we're going to do whatever we want to. Without God working in our life, none of us would ever choose the Lord. Without him working and softening our cold hearts, because the Bible says we're dead in our sin, and we've got to have God come in, illuminate us in some way. So David prays for God's guidance. He also, verses 9 through 10, prays for God's justice. He says, there's no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue, and then look at verse 10. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have what? Rebelled against you. Now, here's the important thing, okay? Those are some strong words, right? Make them bear their guilt, okay? And what does sin do? It leads us to hell. Like, that's the, 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 the guilt payment. They're rebelling against David, okay? This is a time when, whether it's Absalom or somebody else, this is when someone's trying to kill him, destroy him. David, though, is not saying, they're treating me wrong, deal with them. Notice what it says, they have rebelled against you. David knows that he is king because God has made him king and made a covenant. This is the Lord's plan for him. And so David is not saying, destroy them, they're, they're treating me bad. He's not saying, destroy them because, you know, they're against me. He's saying, because they're trying to destroy me, they're trying to thwart the Lord's plan. They're sinning against the Lord, not against David. And so that's why he says, let them bear their guilt. That's where we need to draw the line in these type of songs, Okay. If we're praying against people because they're doing something that upsets us or because we think we're being treated unfair or because we're just mad, 
That's not what David's doing. David's saying, God, I need you to act because these people are just sinful and they're, they're wrecking your plan. And ultimately, we need to understand God will judge people. Whether it's this, it, usually it's going to be the other side of life. Okay? For us, if we're in Christ, it was paid in the past on the cross. Therefore, we stand justified. But for everyone that's not in Christ, unless they repent and give their lives to Christ, they will be paid, that will be paid for on the other side, eternally. Okay? So we've got to be careful in the way we look at that. I'm not saying we're not sinned against because we are sinned against. Okay? Those, those, I don't want to underplay that. Okay? Ultimately, I'll get it, all sins against the Lord, but we're sinned against. Okay? When David in Psalm 51 says, against you and you only have I sinned, he's not trying to say that he didn't sin against Bathsheba. He's not trying to say he didn't sin against Uriah because he clearly did. But ultimately, all sin goes before the Lord. David here is praying this prayer because he knows they are trying to thwart the Lord's plan, okay? So he prayed for God's justice. But then, in 11 and 12, I love how he ends this. Let all who take refuge in you, what? Rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. He prays here for the Lord's blessings. Okay, people are still against him. They're still trying to kill him, take his throne. But he still knows God, God blesses people. He's still clear on that, right? We're never in a position in our life where we, we should not at least know and recognize that God still blesses us. There's never a moment in our life that God has not blessed us. Whether we have, whether we have cancer whether we are staring death in the face, whether we have been victimized and sinned against, whether we have critics, enemies, whatever. There's never a moment in our life where God has not blessed us, right? It's easy for us sometimes to miss that when we're looking around and looking at our life. That's why I think it's so important that David gets up and looks to the Lord first, right? Right? I mean, imagine being surrounded by your enemies who really are trying to kill you, and instead of getting up and looking at the enemy, or maybe seeing how far they've gotten closer to you, you know, or, or looking at your, you know, the, the, your troops, and, and make, you see, instead of doing all of those things, he gets up and offers a sacrifice, knowing he's a sinful person, and he prays. I mean, that's a great way of starting out our day. And when we understand who we are, sinful people that need grace, it's a lot easier for us to be more loving towards people that are not holy people because we recognize, well, if it wasn't for God's grace in my life, I'd be just as evil, just as bad. So I'm glad God's worked in my life. And God, I need you to work in their life, but also know that one day you'll judge everything correctly. And we also need to understand that when we talk about justice, um, we need to understand that there will be a day one day where God will make all things right. Anybody that's been sinned against, victimized, people that, you know, you hear about some of those cold cases of just awful crimes that go unsolved, well, one day those things will be made right. They will. Against a perfect judge that will render a perfect judgment. But now, if we're in Christ, we need to also look at God's blessings in our life. David doesn't rejoice because some of God's covenant people were evil, but because Israel's God had glorified him and the king ultimately through Jesus. And so David really begins his devotion seeking help for himself, but he ends in seeking blessing for all the people. Notice, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. So what he's also saying is, God, I know you are going to bless me I know that you're going to save me. I know you're going to use me. You're going to bless me. Let everybody also know that you do the same for them. That's what he's ending. He ends, he starts saying, God, I need help. <laughs> but he ends saying, God, you've blessed every one of us. And so that also means, though, even though he's prayed here for God to judge people, the people he's calling God to judge are Israelites. 
but he ends, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. So he's also seeking the Lord's blessing on his enemies. God, judge them, but also know you're gracious and you'll still bless them. Right? We don't do that much, right? And that's a way some of our devotional times ought to end. Um, our devotional times with the Lord should not be selfish, meaning this. They should not be just about us. We also need to see, well, how does God's plan in my life interact with the rest of the world? You know, how, do I, how can I be a blessing to others? You know, how can I, even looking at sin, even looking at evil, how can I see how God's work is good enough to reach everybody? Right? And so David, even though he's clearly concerned about himself, is also clearly concerned about the rest of his people, even his enemies, even though he's saying God deal with them. Okay? That's the difference, right? So let's remember that there's no one beyond the scope of grace. There's no one beyond the scope of God working in their life. There's no one that's irredeemable. No one, okay? So whoever it is in our life that we know needs Jesus, you need to find hope in the fact that there's no person out there that God can't save. But we might need to pray differently towards those people and pray that God reaches them and blesses them, right, and allows us the opportunity to do those things for them. Right? We have a role to play in that as well. So that's Psalm 5. And um, as we kind of close, we have.